Once upon a time, there was a Titan. His name was Prometheus, and he was born before the gods. Prometheus had a troubled upbringing, and some of you, like me, may have heard his story while sitting quietly around a candle in class five. When Prometheus was young, the sky was cast into the sea, and there was a great war between the gods and the Titans. For his part in the war, one of his brothers, the great Atlas, was condemned to hold up the world on his shoulders forevermore. Some of his sisters were cast into the pits of hell in Tartarus. Prometheus avoided trouble for a while. He was, after all, the titan of forethought. And so he sat those troubles out and turned his attention to more creative enterprises. He pondered the question, who should inherit the earth? By a river, Prometheus sank his hands into dark mud. He scooped it up and formed a ball, pulling out leaves and twigs so that it was smooth in his palms. And he set about his task. As the day drew on, he pushed and tore and shaped the clay until, with the sun low in the afternoon sky, he had created a little life from the mud, the very first human being. We'll come back to Prometheus later. For now, what I want to share is that this is just one of many creation stories where a great being shaped us from clay. Across the world and throughout history, cultures have pointed to clay as the very source of humanity. When I first learned this, it seemed a strange coincidence. You and I are creatures of flesh and spirit, not mud. After a year spent working with clay, the connection makes sense. Like humankind, clay is malleable and full of possibilities. It can be both fragile and strong, and in the right circumstances, it has the potential to be very beautiful. It's also kind of messy and, <laughs> and takes a lot of work to come close to understanding. It's unpredictable, revolutionary, and diverse. Like many other Waldorf kids, I grew up stubbornly covered in mud. A narrow winter creek ran through our garden. My brothers and I caught tadpoles and let them go again, and built bridges from sticks. Once, after days of effort, we succeeded in redirecting the flow of water about a foot to the left. We ended up with our gumboots filled to the brim, delighted with our work. I've had the chance over the years to try my hand at all kinds of artistic practices, but it wasn't until class nine that I got my hands properly muddy again. I took a semester-long ceramic selective, where I had my first spin on the pottery wheel, pun intended. I was obsessed. I looked forward to those lessons more than anything else. I loved that hour or so a week of chattering away with my hands in the clay. In fact, I loved it so much that I talked to my mum about signing up for a proper pottery course the following year. I'm just going to get a drink of water one sec. Maybe you've just done the maths on that, but the following year was 2020, and the pandemic shut everything down. Sorry. My 16th birthday was spent in lockdown, but one good thing did come out of it. My parents found a second-hand pottery wheel for me, and I began to teach myself to throw. And last year, when the world had started to open back up just a little bit, I was able to take some short courses in wheel throwing, and I settled on pottery as the focus of my Year 12 project. Now, my plan was for this... this microphone. My plan was for this project to have absolutely nothing to do with my personal growth. <laughs> I wanted pottery to be a practical respite for me during the trials and tribulations of class 12. I told everyone that my project would be just about the actual pottery, not my emotions. In a shocking turn of events, <laughs> that didn't really come as a surprise to anyone else, working with clay for a year was an intensely emotional experience. 
and in some ways it was transformative for me. I'd like to walk you through the ways in which clay shaped me by telling you about the processes of shaping clay. Ever since making rainbow candles as holiday presents in kindy, I've loved giving away handmade gifts, and I decided to bring this into my Year 12 project. The central, practical aspect of my project were a collection of what I called my focus pieces. These were gifts for some of the important people in my life. I wanted them to be pieces that the person would use every day, but that would also be meaningful to that person in a unique way. Often, this meant they were based around shared memories with that person, or on their interests. It gave me a chance to reflect on the people around me, and to give back to people I love. I started the year with a very basic skill set. I could make small mugs, bowls and vases. I'd managed exactly one somewhat recognisable teapot, which dribbled dismally. <laughs> I had a lot of work to do if I was going to make the ideas I was coming up with into reality. With rough sketches and ambitious plans, I started many of my pieces with little thought to how they might go wrong. I would sit down at the pottery wheel on a weekend, stick my hands in the mud and hope for the best. You could call my creative process experimental or intuitive or reckless. Sometimes it worked out really well, with everything going smoothly and I was pleased with the results. On the flip side, a number of my pieces did not go as planned at the first attempt. At any stage in the process of making pottery, there are many things that can go wrong. A piece may collapse during throwing. It may crack or warp when drying. You could accidentally trim straight through the side of a pot if you add handles or sculptural details at the wrong point in time. They will just fall off not to mention the potential for work to literally explode in the kiln or fuse itself to the shelf. And these are just the practical, structural issues. Once you get past those, you may or may not have produced the thing you were hoping to make in the first place. I spent a lot of this year finding out every single mistake I could make in pottery. And I won't pretend I was particularly philosophical about it. I'm a perfectionist and insecure about my art. Getting the practical application of an idea wrong makes me feel like a failure. Let's say I start out with brilliant idea number one. I want to make this delicate, pretty, complicated candle holder wreath where little bowls will link together in a circle with some suspended off the surface of the table. It has some emotional meaning. A backstory of a beloved candle wreath and Waldorfy winter gatherings at my grandma's house. And so I set about my first attempt at brilliant idea number one, and the logistics of clay get in my way. Clay is made up of silica particles. They're super small, and they love to hold on to water. Because these particles want to hang on to those water molecules around them, we can use water to help them all line up really nicely and create these really robust structures. With, with clay at just the right stage of dryness, you can build almost anything. The problem comes when the water leaves the piece. Nothing's really holding those particles together. Pottery has to be dried out before it can be fired in a kiln. And when the water that holds together those silica particles evaporates, what you have left is essentially these very carefully arranged dry particles, not really held together by anything other than the stack you've left them in. This stage is called bone dry. It's like a stone wall with no mortar. It's robust enough, but not completely solid. It's possible to build many elaborate structures with wet clay, but the bone dry stage often reveals errors you could never have seen coming. Returning to brilliant idea number one, I set about my first attempt at the piece. I take some rather imaginative approaches to the material, Having carefully used a tiny little bit of wet clay to secure the precarious elements, I leave the piece to dry. Knowing what I do now about clay's ability to defy gravity when there's no water left to build those bridges, it shouldn't have come as such a surprise. The piece collapses. So now what? Brilliant idea number one is broken. 
and my internal tirade turns on the very concept of the piece itself. Why would I think I could make something like that? Would the person it was for even care about it? Should I have even started a pottery project in the first place? And when you give up on your first idea and turn to brilliant idea number two, it's discarded before the clay even makes it to the wheel. Why waste the clay on a first attempt that will probably end just as disastrously as the last one? This story, one that repeated itself many times over the course of this year, ends with me tossing the bone-dry shards of clay into a bucket in the corner and going off to scroll through pottery videos on Instagram. For research purposes, mum. <laughs> Here's the cool thing about clay, though. Before you fire it, clay can be pretty much infinitely reused. If it's still malleable, you can simply squash it up into a ball and start over. And even when the clay has reached its driest point, with no water left to maintain its plasticity, it is still salvageable. By soaking those shards of clay in water and then drying them back to just the right stage, you can save every scrap of clay, every failed piece, and make something new of it. It's a necessary part of pottery, called reclaiming the clay. Of course, it's a matter of practicality. But I also think it has some metaphorical significance. With clay, you get to try again, as many times as you need to. Maybe you make mugs that look like bowls, bowls that look like plates, and plates that look like some kind of abstract art. <laughs> Not on purpose. <laughs> you carve a giant hole out of a base of a vase you were really proud of, or you tear a jug in half trying to add a pulled handle, and the best part of it is, none of it's wasted. You get to try again, every time. And the material can still be reclaimed and reused. I've always felt deep insecurity about my art. How it'll be received, how I'll feel about it when it's done. But working with clay is, I think, beginning to change that. Getting the first attempt wrong isn't a bad thing. Not only can you take the still perfectly usable clay and make it workable again, you can also take the perfectly usable idea and make it work even better. As this year went on, I learned over and over that I couldn't expect to get things right the first time. And I learned to be kind to myself about that fact. Remember how I told you all of those ways that things could go wrong before the work was fired? <laughs> the firing process leaves room for plenty of ceramic disasters. And the worst part is, once it's in the kiln, it's out of your hands. Despite having, in Greek mythology, created the human race from clay, Prometheus is probably best remembered today for a much later gift. I have a very vivid memory of sitting in the Class 5 classroom all those years ago, hushed around the candle, listening to the tale of the Titan stealing fire from the gods and tearing down the slopes of Mount Olympus with a flaming fennel stalk, his great gift. Prometheus brought us, his little clay creations, the gift of fire. Human beings learned to work with fire a long time ago, and it's changed us in many ways. For one thing, we learned to fire clay. The f sorry. Fired ceramic ware was a truly miraculous innovation. It allowed people to store, ferment, and trade food. They could cook soups and broths for those who were unable to tear at meat or chew on dry grains thus raising life expectancy and lowering infant mortality. Fired ceramic storage vessels may have been instrumental in the advent of agriculture. It also changed the way we viewed the resources around us. When clay is fired, the actual structure of the material changes at a molecular level, turning the pliable sheets of mud into something else entirely. The resulting stone-like, watertight material that is fired clay was the first thing that we as humans artificially altered. We changed its very nature. Now, we have knowledge of how to smelt metals, fire glass, and make plastics out of hydrocarbons. But the firing of clay came first. It's a pretty awesome discovery. 
Firing of clay is wondrous, but, it's, but it lets loose some mischievous elemental forces. It can produce unexpected and even disastrous results. Most potters will make joking, but also utterly serious references to the kiln gods, the unpredictable forces that can make or break a batch of work. Early on in my project, my amazing mentor, Lena Martin, introduced me to a group called the Adelaide Hills Ceramics Association. I had the use of a shared workspace and kilns. Under Lena's guidance, I had the opportunity to load, set and fire kilns in both bisque and glaze firings. A bisque firing is the first firing of work. The kiln is heated to just under 1,000 degrees. This gets rid of any remaining moisture in the clay and allows those particles to start fusing together so that the piece is no longer water-soluble. Due to the intense forces at play, a bisque firing will reveal pretty much any structural error you've made. Mistakes ignored at an earlier stage mean pieces that explode, warp or simply collapse. I was lucky to avoid having too many exploded pieces this year, which was a good thing, since my work was fired in a community kiln, and an explosion can damage other work in the kiln. But there was one piece in particular that I was really disappointed to lose. This was a vase made from wild clay. Wild clay means that I dug it from the banks of my little creek and processed it myself, rather than the clay being filtered and homogenised in industrial machinery. It was a really profound experience to work with wild clay, and I talk more about that in my project thesis. But what's relevant here is that wild clay comes with a slew of technical challenges. One of these emerges during firing. When clay is fired, the particles contract together and the piece shrinks a little. How much it shrinks depends on characteristics of the specific clay. In commercially milled clay products, this is much more uniform and predictable. But if the particles are less uniform in size, or if the piece shrinks too quickly, both common problems with wild clay, then the stress on the clay can be too much, and the piece can crack or explode. After a lengthy process, I had managed to throw a small vase on the wheel from my wild clay and carefully packed it into the kiln. Based on that lengthy explanation, it's sort of obvious that my little vase exploded. It was a nice dramatic explosion. It didn't really damage anything else, but I was surprised by how much force must have been building up in the piece. Not all, but most pieces made with this clay had also cracked to some degree during their first firing. And so I knew it wasn't a problem with the individual piece, but with that clay as a whole. This was really frustrating because I'd spent so long processing and working with that wild clay. Plus, I had a whole bag of it filtered and ready to use, waiting at home. I hated the thought that it had all been in vain. After feeling pretty upset about it for a while, I asked my mentor if there was a way to make that clay just a little bit less prone to breaking. And what she explained to me was extraordinary. The solution, it turns out, is fairly simple. Grind up those shards of bisque-fired clay, take the fresh clay, and knead those powdered shards through it. This way, only part of the clay still has to contract and shrink, so the distribution of that contraction is gentler, and the piece stays whole. In other words, you physically incorporate the failed piece to create more resilient future work. What a beautiful thing to do with your disappointments, your failures. <laughs> Now, once a piece has survived its first firing, you add glaze. <laughs> In terms of the potential for disaster, you are not out of the woods yet. <laughs> glaze is a mixture of minerals that fuse together at really high temperatures to create a smooth, glassy surface. A glazed piece is stronger, more durable, and can be made watertight. Also, by brushing or dipping the glaze onto the clay and firing at very specific temperatures, a variety of really beautiful effects can be created. It's the finishing touch, the sparkling exterior that you first meet when you sip from a handmade mug. Despite meticulous planning, sometimes the results are not what you expected. 
Due to the position of the piece in the kiln or the number of pieces in a firing or the vagaries of the chemical interactions between glaze and clay, on some occasions, the glaze firing ruins a piece of work entirely. In our philosophy main lesson, near the end of year 12, we were learning about Lao Tzu, a Chinese philosopher and mystic from somewhere around the 5th century BCE. As I was wrapping up my year 12 project, I came across an idea from Lao Tzu that felt really relevant. Rejoice in the unexpected. This wasn't a mandate to rejoice in really genuine hardship or to ignore the pain that comes with being a human being. It was more about the smaller stuff. The glaze you carefully applied looks nothing like it did on the little test square. Maybe it was the wrong glaze for that clay. Maybe you applied it too thickly or in too thin a coat. Maybe the colour changed completely, and the result is a total surprise. But in many flaws, there is beauty. In many, there is something to be learned for the future. Sometimes the result completely blows your mind. It isn't what you thought it would be. It's even better. If the world were full of perfectly predictable people with the same faces and stories and minds, it would be a pretty boring place. And the same is true of pottery. Each piece has its own unique journey. And Glaze often tells that story best. Maybe the kiln gods were not so malevolent after all. Maybe they were simply guiding me towards some important lessons. And maybe, over time, they were successful. Without my noticing, my perspectives began to shift. I learned to prepare for and avoid disasters in firing, but also, I eventually got comfortable with the idea of not having complete control. Not knowing what to expect meant that opening the kiln was like Christmas morning, complete with a few gifts you could never have guessed it, rather than a nail-biting and horrific parade of mistakes. I had to let the process happen on its own terms, to allow the fire, that precious stolen gift, to transform my pieces and sometimes impart unexpected beauty. A guy called Phil, who was the instructor of a short pottery course that I took at TAFE, had this phrase that he would repeat over and over again, like a mantra. Sign your work. He explained that he wasn't talking about simply scratching your initials into the base of a pot for identification, but about the process of finishing and claiming work as your own. At the time, I'll admit, I didn't quite get what he was on about. My initials would do the job just fine. I knew I'd made it, so did whoever was unpacking the kiln. Job done. My project this year involved a huge amount of practice. After throwing and reclaiming the clay, and starting again over and over, and negotiating with the kiln gods many, many times, I was able to reach a point where I could usually make my ideas into reality. It was an arduous journey. But every step of that journey was my own. Each and every piece I created was worth remembering and claiming, even the wonky ones. And this extended beyond the process of signing my physical work. As I learned, I began to share what I could do with those around me. I gave work away as gifts. I shared my learning and creative process with a small online community through social media. I also ran a semester-long ceramic selective for younger students here at school, with support from several teachers over time. I started out feeling terrified that my lack of experience would show and my lessons would descend into chaos. But the students were enthusiastic and welcoming. Just as they had so many years ago in Class 9, Wednesday afternoons quickly became my favourite part of every week. I started to realise that while my knowledge and skills weren't perfectly refined, I had something to share which had value for others. I had to learn to treat my work with respect, and I had to do the same as I built up my knowledge. In learning to accept and claim the pottery that made up my journey this year, by signing each piece, I was able to accept and claim the expertise I was developing. My year of working with clay taught me many things beyond the actual production of ceramic work. 
It taught me new ways to look at the world and at myself. I learned how to reclaim and reuse the clay from pieces that didn't go as planned. I learned that most mistakes can be salvaged and can even be an essential part of the process of learning something new. I learned to be kinder to myself when, like the clay, my ideas needed a little reshaping. I learned when to let the kiln gods have their way. I got better at taking delight in unexpected results. It started to sink in that while I could prepare my work with anxious precision, some of the most surprising, beautiful and valuable things came when I relinquished control. I was able to treat some of the unexpected events in my life like the unpredictable qualities of the firing process. Sometimes I could take what felt and looked like disasters and salvage the shards of resilience from them. I learned to sign my work. I claimed each and every piece as a necessary step in my journey and was proud of what I could create at each stage. I began to see my own knowledge and inherent qualities in the same way, to own my journey and see the value in each stage of my development. I began to enjoy what I could offer to others, who I could be in the world. In essence, I learned to treat myself like the clay, like this little fellow here, who isn't perfect, but certainly doesn't deserve to be discarded over that. I've had the chance to work really hard at developing a new skill and to create pieces of ceramic art that are beautiful and durable. But the specific and unique qualities of clay allowed me to grow and reflect in ways I could not have anticipated. The things I learned this year are not news. Possibly they're as old as Prometheus. We need not be destroyed by mistakes. We must accept the need to relinquish control. We are richer if we allow ourselves to own every step of a journey. But we each have to learn these things in our own time and in our own way. I will probably have to learn these things again at some point in my life, and that's okay. Humans are malleable. We keep on learning. Even though this has been a story about myself, my growth and my journey, it's about more than just one person. It's about all of us. We are all creatures of clay at heart, of earth and fire, of rebellion and imagination. I'd like to leave you all with a sentiment that my class five self, listening to the story of Prometheus, might have passed on. Don't be scared of muddy hands and muddy clothes. The person you will create is more than worth an extra load of washing. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> Up the back there, there's someone, I think. Oh, Kelly. <laughs> Hi, Dana. I was so interested in, oh, what a beautiful presentation, first of all, but I was also really interested in your wild clay and <laughs> I wondered a little bit about some of the ethics of that and some more of your thoughts about that. Yeah, so I had a lot of fun working with the wild clay. Um, I feel like it's a really beautiful way to find yourself being grounded in the history of working with clay and in the place you're living in. For me, you know, I was digging clay from the banks of the creek I played in when I was three and I would take that and do all these steps and at the end of it I'd be drinking coffee out of a mug that used to be mud and that was a really really like kind of blows your mind like I don't know um, but you know there's evidence of the wild clay in Mount Barker being used by indigenous tribes for body paint and for painting shields um, and, you know, across the country, there's evidence of different kinds of clay being used by Indigenous tribes. And 
you know, the, the earth in Australia is really rich and it's beautiful to work with, and I feel really lucky to have had the chance to do that. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah. Um, over there. Da Dana, great, great presentation. Really impressed. This is a practical question. In the top corner, there's a whole bunch of cups and mugs. Yes. Would you ever, because you didn't mention anything about this, if you brought them out and one handle snapped off, would glue be a part of... <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. you're not going to be able to recreate that exact thing again. Yeah. So one of the really cool things about pottery is being able to let go of things at any stage. Um, but there are some really beautiful repair techniques for pottery. One of those is kintsugi, which is a Japanese technique where you use resin and, you know, gold dust to create these really beautiful um, repaired pieces where you see all those cracks and you see all that damage, but you have the piece with its story, you know, still beautiful and functional. Um, so that's one of those ways that um, you can repair pieces that break after firing. <laughs> Um, oh, I can't see the crowd anymore. <laughs> Over there. What's your biggest pot? Okay. <laughs> so, there are two of them that are on screen. One of them was made in sections, and I don't know if you can see that. Over in the corner, the one with the big sort of donut shape in the middle of it, that was made in three separate sections. Neither of those were, you know, the biggest pot I'd made, so I didn't, you know, I don't feel like they're the biggest thing I've made. The biggest piece I've made is, see in the middle there, that one with the purple and orangey tones. It's actually out in the foyer. Um, that's probably the biggest thing I've made. It's about this big. It was bigger when I made it, but it shrank by about 10%. But that's the biggest thing I've made as yet. There are some really cool ways of making really big, tall pots that are as big as you, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> Started small. Um, Dana, hello. Yes. <laughs> um, you and I have spoken about this quite a lot this year. You know there's one reason that I go on Instagram and that's to see if you've posted something new. Um, could you tell the audience about the page you created and the process that you've gone through to document your work? Absolutely. So one of the challenges I set myself this year was to um, share what I was doing with other people by using social media. So I created an Instagram account for this project, which you can, you know, follow me to see if I ever end up selling work. Um, <laughs> it's called Clay Stories. Um, and on that account, I posted a lot of videos of the processes of making pieces, um, because on the one hand, it was a great way to show people what I was actually doing and all the work that was going into it. But on the other hand, it kept me accountable. It kept me, you know, having to make something so that I could post it and show everyone and like having a schedule to post things. So there's, you know, minute long videos that squash down the process of like massively time consuming pieces into one minute with some nice backing music. Um, and there's also on that page, you can see all of my finished pieces that I created as the focus pieces for my project. It was really cool to look back on that and see the journey across the year as well. Uh, um. Can I quickly follow on from that? Because <laughs> I've loved watching your journey on Instagram and it's not just seeing, I mean, I saw you could see your progress as a potter but also your progress as a social media, like your ability to communicate and to produce content that was really compelling. And I could see um, that you were also creating a bit of a community within the potting Instagrammers. Has that been a, a good source of support for you this year as well? Um, being able to get feedback and to discuss your work with other perhaps more established potters. And this was absolutely fantastic, Dana. So well done. <laughs> absolutely. So I actually, was really surprised when I, you know, started posting my work and sharing what I could do by the amount of really talented and skilled professionals who were, you know, commenting on my posts and offering me tips or, you know, there's this one amazing ceramicist who is somewhere off in America who she makes the most gorgeous work and she randomly started following my Instagram page and then she would like message me and be like, because she's a ceramics teacher and she would message me and say, you know, oh, have you thought about trying this? Or, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, the other person that I had a bit of a celebrity fan moment, um, I had a very short conversation with a guy called Florian Gadsby, who's a ceramicist who lives in the UK. Um, he's a Steiner student. And he posts his work online. He's a bit of a media sensation. He has like over, 
I think across the platforms, about two million people follow his content. And he was giving me feedback and advice and, you know, it was really amazing to be able to connect with people in that way. And also, you know, people who live locally and people who know me and are interested in my work, it was a really great way to keep my motivation and all of that going. Yeah. Uh, oh, up the back, you've got a microphone. Yeah. Overall, what was your favourite thing that you've ever made? Oh, that's a tough question. That is a tough question. Oh. I would say, I don't know if you can quite see them there, but up in the very top corner, there's these little things that are, they're coffee pour overs. Have you ever made coffee with a filter in that little sort of thing, Madhu? But what they're inspired by, I don't know if you can quite see it because it's a bit of a blurry photo, but they're these little reef critters that live um, on the reef that's outside a shack where my family goes sometimes. Little nudibranchs, so sea slugs and sea anemones and all those things. And I was able to make them out of clay and make these little coffee pour-overs for my dad. Um, and I'm really proud of this one because it feels like all my skills coming together. I had to use a bunch of different techniques. And so I was really proud of that one. So that would be my favourite thing, I think. But it's hard to pick. <laughs> um, Harry. Oh, <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> I don't know who to pick. <laughs> you never know. Um, you've mentioned quite a few times that pieces shrink in the kiln, and I yes. know that there was a very specific <laughs> piece that um, was put on hold because of shrinkage issues. Are there ways to calculate that, or was your process trial and error and making it again? <laughs> that is a great question. So... Oftentimes you'll end up, you know, you make a mug that's the right size and it ends up being an espresso cup. Um, but <laughs> normally that doesn't matter because you can say this was meant to be an espresso cup. <laughs> One of the pieces that I was making and that I tried very hard to make was a piece that was actually for Harry over there, um, which was a keep cup that was going to look like a little toadstool. But keep cup lids come in a very specific size. Um, and... I had to throw the pot so that when it shrunk, it would be the exact measurements of that lid. Now, the thing was that I had looked at what the shrinkage of that clay was supposed to be and thrown it to a size that I thought would be correct. I made six of them just in case one wasn't. None of them fit the lids. <laughs> and I felt very upset about that and it took me a while to sort of give it another go because I was like, oh my goodness, because I got to the end of the glaze firing process and I'd just gotten those lids and none of them fit. But my last attempt, it fit and I'm very proud of it. So. <laughs> Dana, it has been wonderful to witness your journey with this class evolving and growing. I, like many others, are curious about the metaphorical um, notion of what is your next bag of clay in life? <laughs> so do you mean in terms of just with pottery or in terms of in general in, in the rest of my life in the world? <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> that one, okay. <laughs> it's a brilliant question. Mum gets asked it all the time. What's Tana going to do? Um, yeah, the simple answer is I don't know. I want to keep doing pottery um, and I am really interested in working towards making pieces that I can sell and that I can, you know, give away and that people can engage with and hopefully make a little bit of money. Um, but, yeah, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I think that the skills I've learned in this project, you know, those all those things I mentioned earlier, I think they will really benefit me in you know, ways I won't know until it happens. But um, I don't know what I'm doing with the rest of my life. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Maren. Thank you, Dana, for this really beautiful speech. Um, uh, you started with saying that you wanted something really practical and nothing that changes you. And I can see you here being very open and very, um, very much more there and, and 
happy without having to be so courageous that it's so daunting. So it must have been an amazing um, journey that you've taken. I congratulate you on that Thank one. You. Um, I was really intrigued by your beautiful weaving of philosophy into the path of the clay that, that was this year. Have you always been so philosophical or was the clay inspiring the philoso philosophy? So um, my grandparents on my mum's side are philosophers and have taught philosophy and have some really beautiful stuff that they've shared with me over the years on that. Um, so I've always been interested in the philosophical stuff. But I have to say, it all really came together when we did our philosophy main lesson and I realised, you know, so many of these things, you know, we were talking about what is a good life and what does it mean to be, you know, a good person and all of those things. And I found that a lot of the things that we were talking about and a lot of the ideas from people over the years sort of came together in this really nice way with what I've been doing with the clay. And so it just felt right to sort of bring that into my speech. It felt like it really... Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Dana. I was... <laughs> I've got two questions. So I was wondering, why does, do you know why clay shrinks when you put it in the kiln? And going off Harry, Harry's question, do you know how to work out how, it sh how much it's going to shrink by? So the reason clay shrinks in the kiln is because those particles melt together a little bit and so there's less air space and they contract and it all shrinks a bit. Um, if you have a really standard clay product, you can sometimes find a standardised version of how much it's going to shrink, but it does defend, depend on your kiln temperature and all those fun things. So, so often it's trial and error, but um, you know, usually it's about 10 to 13%, um, but it really depends. And when you have really specific things that you want it to be a specific size, it can be tricky to predict that. Yeah. All right, uh, Injada up the back. <laughs> Do you still judge all of your work so harshly or has the pottering process helped that overall in general? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so I think I'm learning to be a bit gentler on myself with judging my work. I think I've actually found that by showing people what I'm doing, I can hear that they all think it's beautiful and amazing and so I can start to actually take that on board a little bit. Um, but I think that, you know, there will always be a little bit of me that's a perfectionist, but I'm okay with that. I can sit with that and it doesn't have to be in charge of how I feel about my work or how I look at what I'm doing. Yeah. All right. Now, before I leave you all for the day, I have an awful lot of people to thank. So if you're sick of sitting around, too bad. <laughs> it seems cliched, but I truly do not know where to start with this. Over the course of the year and over the course of my journey with Clay, so many people have made such incredible contributions. I will certainly have plenty more thank yous to say in person later on. If I had my way, I'd go through and thank every one of them. But sadly, I'm on a time limit. So I'll start with a broader scope and narrow it down. First of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of you here in this room. The support of our community is essential in making these projects what they are. Many of you have chatted to me about my work and ideas over the year. You've come to our project showcase. You've shown support in an immeasurable number of ways. And you're here today listening to us speak. Thank you. Second, to all of the teachers within the school who supported my project, Yet again, the number of teachers whose support has been hugely valuable is, well, huge. Your interest and energy have helped me to branch outside of what I thought was possible, helping me to run my ceramics selective and working hard to get the school's kiln up and running. Thank you. To Marcel and all of the other staff and volunteers who have worked, worked behind the scenes to make our showcase and presentations shine, thank you. To the students, who brought enthusiasm and curiosity to my little pottery class. I cannot express how meaningful it was for me to have such a welcoming and kind group to teach. Thank you. Next, to my project supervisors, Robin and Rose. 
You probably did more of the work of fighting back against my perfectionism and insecurity than I did. For convincing me that I was not, in fact, the most incompetent artist to ever try their hand at pottery. For guiding me to resources and new areas of interest. And for listening patiently while I rambled about whatever new technique I had tried on a given week. Thank you. Thank you also to Eleanor and once again to Rose, who as the project coordinators made so much of this process far smoother. To my mentor, Lena Martin. Your guidance this year was invaluable. Your knowledge, patience and willingness to share your time and skills were truly astounding. I learned such a phenomenal amount from you over the course of the year and your generosity has meant the world. Thank you. To my family, all of you, thank you. Aidan and Joseph, thank you for keeping me humble to my face and complimenting my work behind my back. <laughs> or at least that's what mum said was happening. <laughs> but seriously, you guys are the best. To my dad, for innumerable cups of tea, for overlooking the amount of mud I may or may not attract into the house, for understanding that 20 minutes when I'm glazing probably means more like an hour, and for joking about stealing away pretty much every coffee cup I made this year. Thank you. To Mum, for letting me rant about the shrinkage of wild clay while we cooked dinner, for sitting through endless episodes of that one pottery TV show I found, <laughs> for saving the day when my showcase setup looked like a disaster, for reading over paragraphs of my thesis when I emailed them to you on your week off, for helping to edit this very speech, and so, so much more. Thank you. On that note, I'd also like to thank my grandma, Rosemary. Along with Callie and Bill, your wise eyes helped me to turn my project thesis from a garden path story into a structured and meaningful argument. You insisted that the word incredible was overused. <laughs> And while I went through my thesis replacing it, I came across some great synonyms. Magnificent, magnificent wonderful, marvellous, phenomenal, phenomenal, remarkable, spectacular, superhuman, stupendous, miraculous. You're all those things and more. Thank you. I've got more. Just a couple more. To Mark, our class guardian, who has watched us all find ourselves over the last five years and who has brought us dad jokes and chocolate mud cake in our times of need, thank you. And lastly, to my class, I could stand and talk for another full 10 minutes about all of the ways you've supported and inspired me over the years, and especially this year, but I think I might be physically hauled off the stage if I stay here much longer. It's been a privilege and honour to learn with you. I'm so proud of you all. Thank you.